Looking for our speakers. All right. Um, given that we're a little behind time, I'm just going to get go ahead and kick us off. Um, welcome to this breakout session. Uh, my name is Julia Masters. I am um, part of the Colorado Resiliency Office. I work on microgrids. If you're curious about microgrids, uh, we can chat at another time. Um, we have a great uh, session today. And um, without further ado, I am going to introduce our speakers. Whoops. Um, all right, there we go. Um, and why is this not letting me go forward? There we go. Okay, so um, Shale just kind of went over kind of the muting discussion uh, pieces. So um, without further ado, uh, our three speakers today are Pat Keys, an associate professor at CSU. Uh, Sarah Bucci, who's with Climate Nexus, and then Heather Bergman, who is a senior facilitator and president of Peak Facilitation. Um, we'll keep their uh, presentations to about 15 minutes each. If we have time for questions, we will get to them. Um, and Pat, I will turn it over to you to share your screen whenever you're ready. Looks good. Good. Okay. So um, I apologize. I am going to have to scoot probably right at my time uh, because I had something else um, double booked. I can't be in two places at once. Um, but I'm uh, so thrilled to, to be here and I'm so honored based on the, uh, the previous presentations. And um, it's just such a, such a treat to be a part of this. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, radical climate scenarios for fostering agency with the future. And this comes from some of the work that I've done uh, here at CSU, both as an instructor, but also as a facilitator for a variety of, of uh, workshops. In case you hop to the other session in the middle, uh, this is what I'm gonna talk about. Um, climate change is gonna confound our ability to apply past frames of reference to the future. And creative scenario methods, storytelling approaches can actually systematically expand and enhance our anticipatory capacity for surprises. Um, and scenario methods can be taught efficiently, um, they can serve as participatory mechanisms, and they can really support a sense of agency with and in the future. And I'm going to use this phrase unprecedented change, and I just want to give you a flavor of what I mean by that. So this is a, a graph, I promise there won't be very many graphs. This is a graph of changes in temperature out to the end of the century produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. This is the group that's tasked with thinking about and putting together uh, climate information from around the world. Um, and we're sort of on this trend right now. This is with our policy commitments, things that we've said we would do globally in terms of reducing our emissions. Another way of looking at that is saying that this is a world where on average, important, every year will be the hottest year in living memory. Um, now in practice, it's not gonna be every year is gonna be the hottest year. Some years will be a little bit colder, some years will be a little bit hotter. But this is what I mean by unprecedented. We've never experienced this, uh, at least not in modern times. So how is society gonna orient, anticipate, and navigate this unprecedented future? And I just wanna zero in on that word future very quickly. Um, if we think about right now and all of the potential things that can happen into the future through time, we can think about a basic extrapolation. This is like a simple way, a business as usual, something that's really boring, easy and wrong, but very easy. We could also use a word like probably, something will probably happen. We would have a level of confidence that this might happen in the future. Around that, we might say something's plausible. So probably plausible. These are words that like scientists might say, use statistics to describe. We might build models to describe these futures, things that we can kind of reduce the complexity and, and, uh, and uh, model them with some mathematics. Beyond that, though, we have things like possible, things that we say, oh, that, that might happen. Uh, we've left the realm of statistics, maybe, and we now have something that's maybe a bit more um, open-ended. Around that, we have preposterous. These are things that we might say are impossible. They won't ever happen. This is usually a good place to look because probably those things are going to happen if we've said that they're, uh, they're never going to happen. But these don't say anything about preferability, what we would want to have happen, value judgments, things that we think are good or bad. And this is critical when we think about the future. 
And this is where the idea of radical futures comes in. It's a vision of the future that pushes the boundaries of social, environmental, and technological limits, possibly exceeding them. You might say, why do we need something like that? Why do we need radical futures? Why can't we use typical methods? The future is going to be a strange place compared to today, especially anything after 2070. And just as an example, this is where I would maybe have some participation or something like that. This is an advertisement, right? So this is something that you maybe have about 25 or 45, 50 years ago, you would open up a magazine, like a real paper thing. And then you looked at this and you would have seen this or something like it. And you would look, and we can look at it now. We can look into the past and recognize this is an advertisement for some uh, pre-pelotons, right? Some, some, some exercise bikes, uh, maybe some rowing machines or something like that. But we can look at the past and, and we can make sense of this. Compared to this, this is an ad now, okay? This is something advertising, um, uh, advertising some technology. Let's imagine that I don't know what this is. There's no, there's no context, there's no people there. Um, I know that this is a VR headset, but the point is, is that these people trying to look from the past into the future would probably not recognize that this is, let alone a computer that you wear in your head, uh, it's something that you use for exercise. This is what I mean when we need to start exercising different kinds of muscles to think about radical futures, this sort of strangeness. Put a different way, we have lots of tools to explore these futures. I just showed you a graph. Those graphs were made using tools in this realm. We have far fewer tools to explore these futures, the possible, the preposterous, and the preferable. And that's where story-based futures come, come in. These are things that systematically let us explore possible things, preposterous things, and the preferability of things. To move beyond descriptions and graphs toward textured visions that we can inhabit, that we can visit these futures. I love that Octavia Butler was <laughs> mentioned in the last session. Uh, she has this uh, fantastic quote on the power of stories. There's no single answer that will solve all of our future problems. There's no magic bullet. Instead, there are thousands of answers at least, and you can be one of them if you choose to be. I'm just gonna talk about two projects very briefly where I've used radical futures as a vehicle, as a mechanism to allow people to explore these um, uh, radical different possibilities. So first off, I wanna talk about this um, uh, sea level rise uh, course that I teach at CSU, Colorado State University. And I use this mostly for my undergrads to synthesize the content across an entire semester. Uh, the course is highly interdisciplinary. It covers everything from geophysics to policy and ethics and culture. Um, and what I want my students to be able to do is try and put these pieces together and learn and think about the future. And so what I do is actually train them to become uh, futures methods practitioners, you could say. I have them think 30 to 50 years into the future. I have a series of kind of workshop-based materials that I present to them. I, I present what futures methods are. I train them in how to do world building. I train them in storytelling, and then I train them in how to really kind of probe that kind of strangeness, those strange possibilities of the future. And it's typically a full set of like four lectures, but it can be it can be standalone or it can be kind of a blitz where we do it in a couple hours. And then the outcome of this is they actually write short stories in my classes. They each write uh, their final project is essentially a short piece of science fiction, uh, short fiction, um, and they have a scientific supplement, et cetera. Um, and the stories cover all sorts of different dimensions of sea level rise. They, they, they tackle things like waste, material uh, uh, intensity, um, landfills, um, um, endangered species, uh, historic segregation and the consequences of that moving forward. They even cover kind of more um, uh, esoteric topics, at least in the, uh, in the scientific community, like geoengineering. I've taught this to more than 100 students, which means more than 100 unique climate change stories um, and the surprising thing I found is that this has led to my students actually reporting back to me that they all of a sudden now feel a better sense of agency in and with the future that they didn't have before. Totally unexpected, unintentional, uh, but a really interesting side effect that I'm now kind of leaning into when I teach this class. And very quickly, um, a, a second project that I wanted to mention is something that I did uh, recently over the past year, looking at Colorado's climate and water futures. Um, and this was really to deliberately uh, try and discover unexpected climate and social surprises in Colorado. And uh, this was done in collaboration with uh, many different groups, uh, in the, mostly in the front range. And this artist, the artist that made this work, his name is Fabio Comin, 
And he, I've worked with him for a number of years uh, developing concept art to accompany these stories. And we sought to answer these questions. How can we deliberately explore climate change futures for Colorado, linking projections of statewide climate change with underlying IPCC scenarios? Are there futures that we're systematically failing to consider that maybe we don't even realize we should be paying attention to? And what might we, what might we find if we look in these kind of unexpected places, these unexpected domains? And so to do this, I assembled a group of uh, practitioners, scientists, uh, uh, civil, uh, civil society members from uh, city government, uh, NGOs, federal organizations, uh, and then scientific or organizations where we sat around tables and I did the same thing that I do with my sea level rise students. I trained them in these methods so that they could then practice thinking about these uh, futures that we're maybe systematically not paying attention to. And something that came out of this was they did, they absolutely, people always say that they can't write fiction and then they totally impress me. Uh, I'm not surprised anymore that they write incredible stories uh, about the future. We all have the capacity to do this. Um, and this group was no different. And they did reveal some unexpected aspects of the future where if uh, we aggressively transform our emissions trajectories, we radically reduce our material intensity, but maybe we misunderstood one part of the climate system and things actually got a little bit hotter than we expected, even though we changed everything, what happens? And so they were able to, through stories, explore the social, economic, political implications into the future in a way that we can't do with a model. You just can't do that with a model in the same way. And so because of that, the outcome when we were trying to get feedback and synthesize around these new futures, it turned out that this last item, perception, might actually matter a lot more than we realize for where we're headed and what we might get, a lot less than what we actually get in terms of the temperatures. It's a lot more of what we think we're gonna get and what we wind up getting. At least this is something that the stories were telling us. So just to wrap up, this was very fast. Um, radical futures methods are, can help society to orient, anticipate, and navigate these unprecedented changes by allowing us to think about the questions in a different way, really activate our senses of agency, and to imagine things that will really are really hard to explore with other methods. Um, and I just wanna close with this quote from Kim Stanley Robinson, you can never properly predict the future as it really turns out, so you're doing something a little different when you write science fiction. You're trying to take a different perspective on now. Um, and so with that, I'm, again, I'm so thankful for being a part of this, this summit. Um, please reach out to me. I, I, I'm sorry that I can't stick around for questions, um, but that's an excuse for you to email me. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to start a conversation. Um, a lot of these stories are actually available on my website. So if you go there, you can check out, go to the research section. Um, you can look at the artwork. You can look at the stories, even some of the stories uh, some of the students have been gracious enough to share. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pat. Appreciate your time. Um, we will have uh, Pat's contact info and everyone's info afterwards. So um, yeah, uh, you will be able to get in touch with him. Thank you so much for your time. Feel free to drop off and go to your next thing. Um, and with that, um, I will take the screen back and pass it over to Sarah, um, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about water-related things. So um, Sarah, whenever you're ready. Great, thanks, Julia. And I know as we like get rushed for time, I get, I'm getting like antsy with that. So I'm just gonna like take a deep breath before I start and I hope everyone can like release some of that rushed feeling with me. Ah, <sighs> okay. Um, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I don't have that many slides. Um, I just wanted to share some imagery with you all while I'm talking. Um, so Julia, I'll just let you know when I want you to kick to the next one. Um, so by way of introduction, my name is Sarah. Um, I am the Director of Strategic Communications with the Water Hub at Climate Nexus. Um, I live here in Denver, Colorado. Um, so um, I don't, I work nationwide. Um, and so I'm, I have, um, lots of partners in Colorado, but don't always get to do stuff, um, in the state. So I'm, I'm particularly excited to be here for that. Um, the water hub is a small nonprofit communications organization. Um, as I mentioned, we're a project at climate nexus and we use story-based strategies to advance 
water justice and resilience. Um, we work with water advocates and experts, journalists, um, with a goal of making water and climate communications more accessible. Um, so we do that by um, adding capacity to support groups that have historically been under-resourced, uh, generating media that builds water literacy and emotional engagement, um, and working to shift the narratives around climate um, and the environment from ones of scarcity and sacrifice to uh, focus on progress and possibility. Um, and uh, we focus on issues like drinking water access and affordability, uh, climate impacts on communities, including drought and flooding, and also integrating arts and cultural work to help people reconnect with their relationship to water. Um, and so my lens today is going to be talking about uh, values-based communications and giving you a sneak peek of a water hub campaign that's focused on um, infrastructure and water and climate resilience. Um, I think that's hopefully very relevant and important to this group because often how folks experience climate is through weather and water and climate adaptation often centers around water and infrastructure. So um, I think there'll be a lot of overlap. Um, this campaign, this um, image, which is created with a designer named Dio Kramer that we are working with is from the um, homepage of a new website that we're gonna be launching in part of this campaign in February. Um, and, uh, it's called, the campaign is called Just Infrastructure Water Investments at Work. And what it's designed to do is connect the billions of dollars in climate resilience and water funding, um, from the federal government, um, to what that means for our real everyday lives. Um, and my big picture takeaway is that, um, in order to really connect with folks as we're talking about, um, the climate adaptation and resilience work that we're doing in communities is to lead with our values that we share and tapping into people's closely held concerns and beliefs. We want to speak to the problems people are currently experiencing and offer a solution. And um, when folks often hear about infrastructure and one of the reasons we embarked on this campaign and, and heard from our partners, there was a real need to like humanize and um, connect emotionally with um, the this, these kinds of big investments in infrastructure is because when people hear words like infrastructure, they often think like, oh, roads and bridges. Or if they think about water, they think about big, great infrastructure like pipes and water treatment plants. And, and we know that's a, hu a huge part of what infrastructure is, but it really is so much more than that. And it really is about creating livable, thriving communities. So whether it's rivers or rain gardens, water mains or wetlands, water infrastructure includes both the built and natural systems and the people that move water through our landscapes and communities. Um, so if you want to go to the next one, Julia, um, this first uh, our campaign is broken into a couple of topics, and that includes, and that'll be the three image, the three next images I share around um, access to safe water and sanitation, flood recovery and prevention, and dealing with drought. Um, and this image really centers around the value of the human right to water. Um, so there are still two million people, probably more, in the U.S. who are living without running water or working toilet. And um, many more communities are needing to update old water delivery systems to make sure they're safe. Um, you know, I, you might be like me living in Denver. I'm on the list to have my lead service line replaced by Denver Water. I'm very excited about that. Um, and climate change is, is pushing many of our drinking water systems to the brink. Um, and drinking water concern and care about the safe and accessibility of drinking water is a real commonly held concern. Um, we have we often find framing issues around the impact on drinking water, whether it's um, availability or safety, um, is really resonant with a lot of audiences. And so that's one of the reasons I want to share this. Um, but as we've been hearing in the panel today, we really need to look at the future we want to create and the solutions that we want to create to help people move past that those feelings of 
fear or anger around the situation that we're in today. So if we want to go to the next one, um, and this is an example of that around um, our next topic on flood prevention. So green streets as flood protection. Um, great storytelling paints the picture of the future that we want. And we've, we've heard that from a lot of the speakers today. Before her poem, Andrea said, show them what you're for. Um, uh, Destiny, I think, is in the room in her presentation. You asked us to imagine the world we want to live in. Um, and so uh, we want to paint a picture of a world where every family has safe water. Our communities are thriving. We are able to weather storms or droughts. And our environment is healthy for people and wildlife. And that also really means speaking to people's lived experiences. Um, dealing with flooding, it's not just a phenomenon, it's real people who have water back up in their basements or your neighborhood road gets cut off um, because of high waters. Um, families have to rely on bottled water during or following storms. These kinds of personal narratives um, show, um, really help to make the um, these impacts relatable. Um, before I go into some of the solutions framing, I also just wanted to take an opportunity because um, I know there's a lot of folks from local government or, or agencies um, in this um, at this summit. Um, our friends at the Water Now Alliance, which is a network of urban water leaders, have a program called the Colorado Project Accelerator, where they provide free technical assistance to um, public drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater agencies who are looking at implementing um, climate and water resilient solutions. And their um, current um, free TA program is open for applications right now. And so I'm going to just drop in the chat a link to that because that might be something that you're interested in and could take advantage of. Um, and I'll just plug for them. Um, but Anyway, so it was a little bit of a non sequitur, but to overcome um, that kind of paralysis or that fear, we also really need to explain how solutions are within reach and um, focus on the why in addition to the how um, when we're explaining about projects um, or potential programs. So if we want to go to the next one, um, I'm sure for all Coloradans, we think about water supply quite a lot and worry about the future of um, having enough water in Colorado or in the Colorado River system. Um, and um, so I really love this image around catching rain. This is something that um, I was in Tucson last year um, for an event, and um, I think they've they're doing some really incredible work and in capturing water during the monsoon season letting it seep into the ecosystem and into the groundwater and being able to utilize it later. Um, and um, it was really beautiful to see some of those things in action. Um, and so um, when I talk about explaining uh, the why, um, what I mean is for a lot of communities, when I read about infrastructure dollars or adaptation plans in the news or in headlines, or even in like fact sheets from local governments, a lot of times what I see is like dollar signs and a lot of focus on like process and um, specifics of the project, but they don't really talk about what life was like before, how it, whatever issues being dealt with is impacting people on a personal level, and then how that investment will change things for the better and the emotional resonance for the community that's gonna benefit. Um, focusing on those benefits rather than just the dollars or describing those project specifics helps to sell people on the importance of that investment. Um, you can also do that by connecting the dots to other issues like housing, air quality, food, park equity, economic opportunity. Um, one example of a project that we're highlighting in our infrastructure campaign from Colorado is around modernizing irrigation on the Yampa River. Um, this river supports ranching and recreation and fish and wildlife, but like most Western rivers, climate change is really stressing the Yampa. Um, and um, groups like the Nature Conservancy, um, partnering with the Maybell Irrigation District up in Northwest Colorado have gotten funding 
from the bipartisan infrastructure law to team up and address um, some issues to use water more efficiently in um, on the ranches. And so they're lining irrigation canals to prevent water loss. They're installing a step structures to like allow for safe passage for the fish and boaters who use the river, um, funding remote operated head gates to make it easier to adjust the flows. So both fish and farmers get what they need. But those are just kind of, that's like a laundry list of like what that project's doing. But if we wanna think about what does that mean? It shows how, how investing in smart technology is gonna allow us to live well with less water and also balance a lot of different needs together. So taking into consideration agriculture, recreation, and the environment um, all as one rather than us competing interests. Um, we work with a great group of environmental NGOs who have a, uh, a great campaign on Colorado River Resilience. Um, which has been pulling together these types of projects and strategies um, in the basin to highlight projects like these that are really multi-benefit. Um, so I want to share that one too, because it's just a great resource, um, particularly if folks are looking at how we can um, work together with the environment and make do with um, less water. Um, so that that's basically a wrap on my presentation. Um, this campaign is going to launch next month, which is exciting. So I'll drop uh, just a personal plug, the Water Hub newsletter sign up link in the chat too, because if you want to get it in your inbox, I mean, if you sign up to our newsletter, that's a great way to. Um, so just before my time ends, just to summarize um, some of the great elements of being a climate resilience and adaptation storyteller, you want to connect with people through shared values and your emotions. Um, using personal narratives to make sure the topics you're talking about are relatable, um, using accessible language, not getting bogged down in technical jargon, um, and then again, centering that hope and optimism and giving people a path forward to see um, the solutions that we can implement. The equation that I kind of like to say is urgency plus hope equals action, um, and so um, yeah, that's that's what I've got. down that that equation because that was great um we do have maybe time for one or two questions for sarah if anybody has things that have come up during her presentation and if you do have a question you can just come off mute and ask it Hi, Sarah. A quick question for you. I'm actually here in Denver, Colorado. I assume you're not in here in Denver because unfortunately they have a moratorium on the amount of water that you can actually harvest. I think it's only like 110 gallons uh, because the water has to move basically. So there's actually uh, laws against harvesting water. Uh, just again for here, I know other places uh, don't have that problem. Uh, and I'm assuming if you were in Tucson, you were probably at Brad Lancaster's uh, dry land water harvesting and I'll I was, there. yeah <laughs> I do live in Denver um yeah I know you can you can have rain barrels I I think you're right it's like 110 gallons or something like that um yes. which I've I've been I'll admit I I've done some drought smart uh landscaping at my house but I've been like the getting the rain barrel on my to-do list is something I have not gotten yet in the last two years that I really need to get on it <laughs> Actually, again, I'm actually working with the city of Littleton right now to do some harvesting out of some of their parking lots uh, to, to water various things. Again, you know, use what you have. Um, uh, but basically, again, if the water is continuously moving, so I think you can actually even like put it into an area and then like maybe we're looking at maybe pumping it up back uphill and then allowing it just to, uh, uh, you know, go into the soil and use that as a reservoir which I don't believe is going to, you know, I think there's creative solutions around, uh, uh, you know, how things currently are right now. So anyway, just wanted to just say hello. Thank you for the information. Great. Thanks, Thanks so much, James. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will move on to Heather. Sarah, thank you so much for your time. And um, if folks want to follow up with her specifically, maybe she can put her email in the chat. 
Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Heather. Thanks so much, Julia. Hi, everybody. I am Heather Bergman. I am a conflict mediator and I'm a group facilitator. And my clients are almost exclusively governments. And uh, what we often do is we get uh, hired to facilitate stakeholder dialogues where we bring a bunch of different people from a bunch of different sectors together for them to see if they can't deliberate for a bit and then make a recommendation on a policy or project um, or what have you uh, to a local uh, state or federal government. And what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, about is how we use stories uh, to help groups get to consensus. And um, so I uh, I want to start by saying how people show up on the first day of a new stakeholder dialogue. Man, is it bumpy. Um, folks show up and they are defensive and they're guarded with their body language and their faces and their words and they're suspicious of each other, of me, of whatever agency or um, group of humans is convening them. Um, they are untrusting and um, they're organizational and positional. And I put these in bold because it's super important. Um, we often seat a dialogue uh, based on a position or a perspective or an entity. We need a this kind of government person and a that kind of environmental person and a that kind of a ranch person or what have you. Um, so we already we signal to people that they're supposed to be organizational when they show up, and they do. So they will introduce themselves as, you know, I am the person here from the government agency of this name, and I'm here to make sure that you all know that our position is this. And so it starts out pretty hot and pretty tense. Um, my most recent uh, version of this is I had a member of a city council show up to a city council retreat, and he brought his own campaign poster to the retreat, and he just said it in front of himself at the table so we could all just remember what he was about when he was running. That's, that's positional. That's organizational. That's a reminder that we're here to be in conflict. Um, my job as the facilitator is to make that go away. Um, I work really hard to help stakeholders learn to connect with each other as actual people, um, as Coloradans, as parents, as kids, as outdoors people, maybe as indoors people, depending on the people. Um, we talk about music a lot because people love to visit about music. So fans of this kind of music or fans of that kind of music. And also we talk about food and often people just, just really connect with one another as also people who oppose uh, Brussels sprouts on principle all the time. Um, but the goal here, right, is, is to help them connect as humans and to show their own humanity and connect with the humanity of other people. Um, so we do that in a couple of ways. Um, the first one is uh, through our own stories, our stories as facilitators. Um, I tell a lot of stories and um, I will often start uh, when a group gets in a tough spot, I'll tell them a story about another stakeholder group who was also once in a tough spot and they found an agreement and let me tell you how they did it. And it's very cheery and optimistic. And I, I use that story to help them connect to the possibility of that being their own story of future goodness and agreement. I'll also tell stories about courage and vulnerability that I've seen in a stakeholder group. Um, one I'm telling a lot lately because it was so powerful is a guy from a federal agency trying to find an agreement with a really complicated group of stakeholders. And what he said is, I need you to know that I'm a man on a leash and I will pull against the leash as hard as I can, as far as I can in your direction, but the leash is the leash. So I need for you to come a little bit closer to me and so if I push, pull against my leash, if you could just meet me right there, I think we can get there. And it was this amazing breakthrough moment of him acknowledging his own restrictions, but also showing how he was trying to reach or cross the divide between him and the other stakeholders. Um, that story is great. And it was a, it's a federal person. So I tell it a lot in stakeholder groups with feds because they get a little tight. Um, I also tell stories about creativity and conflict and collaboration. Um, again, my goal here is to help people see that this story of this other person or this other group can become this group's story too. Let me tell you about a time, this other group, they were stuck just like you're stuck. And then someone said, what if I just draw this? on the whiteboard and they go and they get a, a marker and they draw something on the whiteboard and then everyone else goes, oh, ooh, yeah, that. Um, I love to tell those stories to give people a sort of a, a sense of the future that they can create as a stakeholder group um, together. I also tell a lot of stories about myself. Um, and I do it for two reasons. One is to create a safe space for innovation, error, and learning. I tell a lot of stories about what a doofus I am. Um, and I do that. Uh, 
because it shows that we can we can mess up and that's what we do here. We can try things and it, it will go badly some of the time, but let's let's do that. That's what true innovation is. And I will also tell stories um, about myself and my family um, that are embarrassing or funny to break the tension. I do use humor a lot in my work. I was pleased to see some of the other sp speakers talk about that, the need for laughter and how it creates a human connection. And sometimes stakeholders find common ground in groaning at my stories or in laughing at my stories and I'll take either. But most importantly, like we help our stakeholders find um, their own humanity and see one another's humanity through their stories. And we sort of break stories up into two kinds. We talk about stories of the past. And uh, this is where we invite people to talk about who they are and how they got here and what their challenges or adventures were getting to this table, this stakeholder dialogue today, right now. Um, but I also like to talk about stories of the future. And these are the stories when I ask people to tell me, what does success look like for you? What is your vision for your children or your, or what are you afraid of for this community? And all of those are stories they tell each other about futures they want or futures they don't want. And then the rest of our time together is about how do we make the good stories come true and the bad stories not. Um, this happened to me just two days ago in a meeting. I asked the stakeholders to work in mixed groups to talk about what success looks like for them. And there's one guy who everyone talks about as being super cantankerous and difficult. And when he spoke, he just said, success to me is we can all sit down and just respect each other. And other people were like, oh, yeah, that. And it was a great moment. And then it was a wonderful meeting and I think they're gonna do fine. Um, but sometimes it's just those little little nuggets of, of future storytelling that, that get us over the hump. So the way we often get you to tell us your stories is through icebreakers. And I know people groan when they go to a meeting and I have icebreakers on the agenda and that they're like, is she gonna ask me what kind of a tree I wanna be? No, she is not. Cause that is a terrible icebreaker and no one should ask you that question. Um, good icebreakers are really powerful because they invite the participants in a stakeholder group to share something not controversial or not confrontational about themselves. In a, in a meeting, I wanna hear every voice at the beginning of the meeting. And I wanna have them do that in a way that doesn't put angst and drama in the room. So I do that with the stories that I ask them to share. Um, I also use icebreakers to help us find common ground in our daily lives. What do we eat? What music do we like? All these kinds of things where we start to see, yeah, we're people, we all eat. It's the simple things, honestly, that get some of the groups to an agreement. Um, again, I use uh, stake or icebreakers to have people tell, show a little bit of vulnerability, a little bit of, um, you know, what's a time that you were super embarrassed? What's a funny thing that happened to you? What's the worst gift you've ever received? Um, those, all those stories, again, sometimes it's groany, but it's that, vul that human vulnerability that really connects people. Um, so my overall goal with an icebreaker, right, is to give us a window onto the humanity that everyone shares. Um, and I am in love with it, even though it makes you groan. So now you have good answers for, for icebreaker questions. The kinds of questions I ask, I ask um, almost universally with a first stakeholder dialogue meeting, I will ask, where are you from and what was special about that place? I also like to ask, what was your first job and what did you learn there? We get a little vulnerability. I learned I am not good at engineering or whatever. Um, what did you wanna be when you were a kid? And I really love what is your family's holiday tradition? These are great stories. Cause while people are talking, I'm not listening to the talker so much as I'm looking around the faces at the people who are listening. And what I see is what they hear. And you see the connection in their eyes. They're like, hey, that city slicker, he's from a small town just like me, huh? Or he's from a ranch just like me, wow. Um, or that person had such a, an adventure or challenges to get here to this table, challenges in their life, challenges in their job, challenges with the government trying to get over whatever the barrier is. People have stories of difficulty. That person also values tradition. We see a lot in stakeholder dialogues when we're talking about change, um, that people who oppose the change think that people who want the change don't value tradition. When we ask people to share their family traditions, we learn that in fact, they do. Um, also, you know, that person's life has been full of crazy stories. They worked in a fast food restaurant. People always talk about their first jobs at breaks. It makes a great human to human connection. I also worked in a fast food drive-through. Um, and also, again, with the family stories, wow, that person and I have so much in common. Their family is also full of nuts. 
Yay, I should visit with them about that at the break. Again, the goal here is just for, for people to see that person that I thought was the organization, I thought was the position, in fact, is a real life person, a human being with history and with family and with dreams, just like me. Um, so the other way we do this is we ask people to tell us about their motivations, the driving stories and needs that bring them to the table. The orange picture is here because you've probably heard every facilitator ever. We tell a story about um, the parent who had one orange left and two children are fighting over it. What a great problem for a parent to have these days, right? Instead of dividing the orange where each child just gets half of what they want, um, if the parent just asks each child, why do you want this orange? One might say, I'm really thirsty and I'd like the orange juice. And the other would say, I'm taking a cooking class and I'd like to have the peel so I can use the zest to make a cake. Once we know the underlying motivations of people, then um, we can peel the orange and each kid, kid gets 100% of what they want just because we ask this why question. So when we talk about motivations, we're really trying to separate people's positions, what they showed up with on that first day, all crossed armed, right? The position is the thing that you want, the answer to the question that you've been asked to solve with the group. Positions are binary demands because you either get them or you don't. There's only one answer. It is yes or it is no. Um, they're static. They're, an they're anchored in that first day meeting. They don't generally change over the course um, of a stakeholder dialogue. But interests, that why question, wow, that's the why you want what you want. And when we get to this, we start to get descriptions of future conditions, the stories of what we want to see in the world. And there's so many ways to get to, to meeting people's interests. And if interests are dynamic, they can adapt. And this really opens up our problem solving space with our, with our participants. Um, so interests like those icebreaker responses, these are stories that we ask our stakeholders to tell us about the future that they want to create. Once we have their interests, we say, okay, this is together, your interest, your interest, your interest, together become the future we want to create together. So now we need to figure out how are we going to do it? And then I ask, what if? And the what if day is my favorite day. I just did a what if day last night um, with a stakeholder group and they're the best. And this is where I just say, don't worry about the rules. Tell me what if we, and then just propose something. And the what if conversation is super great because um, it invites this future thinking about the better world with a great story without the constraints of rules, habits, history. I always tell people, don't even worry if it's legal. We'll figure that out later. Tell me your best ideas now. The feds, they hate it when I say that, but I say it anyway. Um, the other thing about the what if conversation is it creates this multi the, the, these multiple approaches to the, that future. So we list them all and then we can talk about them more later. And everyone starts to see the potential of the future that we can create together with our work. It's just the best. Um, it creates energy and excitement in the room, even if it's a virtual room. Last night I did it with a virtual sticky board and just stickies are just popping up. What if we this? What if we that? What if we create a nonprofit? What if we do this? What if we buy land? What if we work together? And it's just this wonderful moment of coming together um, to build that future. And so the what if day, it's, it helps initiate this new story about the future and this new story for the future. And it is, it, it's, it's so much fun. Come to a meeting when it's what if day, you'll love it. So those are all things that we do as um, your paid facilitators. And I appreciate that you don't always have them, but climate resiliency, this is a thing that people talk about in our local communities all the time. So here's what you can do without a me. Ask for people's stories. Focus your requests on their family, their history, their music, their food, their traditions to find that connection. Um, and as you're doing that, tell your own stories because people need to know who you are as a human too. Make sure they know where you came from, how you got here, and what your first in-person concert was and why it was awesome. Eat and drink with people who disagree with you to do that share, shared storytelling and find the human connection. Ask other people for their whys. Why, why do you think that's the best way? Why are you even here? Why do you care? Um, and then listen for their vision for the future. Share your why so other people know your future story. Ask for ideas and what ifs um, to create that future story and share your own ideas um, for your own the, own, the future that you wanna see. At the end of the day, just like show up, be open, be creative, be vulnerable and be a human person. And you're gonna find a way to solve the problem with the person that you're talking to. That's all I got for you today. Happy to answer any questions if I can. 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, we have maybe three minutes for questions. So I assume there will be some questions for Heather. Um, if you want to come off mute, mute and ask your question, that would be great. Mm, fine. I didn't want to answer your question anyway. They're Heather, like, I have Go a ahead. question. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious how you became a facilitator. Mm. Oh, wow. That is a story that is longer than three minutes. But the highlights are, I thought I wanted to be an uh, environmentalist and I got a job as an intern for an em environmental organization and that was not a good fit for me. But while I was uh, working there, that organization was a stakeholder in someone else's dialogue that was actually facilitated by our friends up at the Keystone Center where Ernest works. Mm -hmm. Um, and I saw the gal who was facilitating that. And I was like, that's what you do if you care about these issues, um, but you don't have an investment in the answer. You bring everybody else together and let them figure it out. And then I worked up there for a long time. And then I started my own company. Here we are. Awesome. Um, maybe you could help answer the question that was in the chat earlier around um, recommendations for like framing climate work for a more conservative audience. I know that's that's broadly what you just talked about, but any maybe like more pointed comments on that? Super interesting. Um, what I find is, first of all, not an audience that generally resonates with the word climate at all. Mm -hmm. um, but if we talk about landscape health, um, ranchers, farmers are really concerned about the long-term health of the landscape. Um, we talk about water availability. Um, these are you know, these are values and needs that you that 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 regular people have on a day to day basis. And we don't for those audiences need to talk about um, why everyone thinks the, the landscape is a hot mess or why everything everyone thinks there's less water. There just is. And we need to figure it out, um, figure out how to solve it, how to supply it. And it it's better. And also a great place for stories because ranchers will tell stories about what the landscape looked like when they grew up there. And you can see their passion for the land. And that's the connection. Hi, Heather. Um, is it okay if I ask? The, yes, if I, I was the original asker of the question. Yeah. Um, so I just had a kind of a follow up. Oh. Um, so we, I'm in a town that is a resort community. Um, so we have a very tourism based economy, a lot of second homeowners. And our second homeowner population um, tends to be more conservative. Um, they also are tend to be on the wealthier side um, without that rancher background. Um, so they are kind of on the other side of the conservative spectrum, um, just in terms of, of economic background and, and experiences and things like that. So how would you kind of frame the question to those people who think that we're going to take away their gas stoves and their fireplaces and um, that anything like switching to electric vehicles is going to be a negative impact on them. Um, just kind of things like that. We're trying to work on reframing, reframing our conversation. So it's more about the benefits to them than it is about us taking away anything from them. Um, and then talking about like energy efficiency in terms of cost savings and, and things like that. Um, but we're just having a, a harder time kind of addressing some of their their focus on a lot of the details that won't necessarily impact them, even though that tends to be their focus. We are about to close in 20 seconds, so maybe we can follow up um, offline. Okay. But, uh, thank okay. you.